as we were looking at adopting VR for the overall all program, um, one of the gaps that we identified early on um, back in um, 2017, 2018, when we were first exploring VR was that there were no social work specific applications of VR um, available for us to use. So one of the side effects of that was that um, we decided that we would develop our own virtual reality learning environment that we could then integrate into the program. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the fit of the, um, the simulation that we developed um, within the curriculum. We'll talk about how we developed that content. And then we'll give you a quick five minute video um, to see what it actually looks like and um, a two dimensional version of what the students experience. And then we'll talk a little bit about future directions. Um, on the screen here, you're seeing a graphic of our development program. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time today, so I can't really get into that. But if you're interested in learning more about how we develop this, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to discuss that in more detail. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so the first thing as we were exploring VR is we really wanted to figure out how we could fit some sort of learning environment into our curriculum and where it made sense to do that. Um, so we really started to think about how we could develop an experiential learning experience for our students that would be engaging um, and would be applicable to um, skills or understanding that they would need for their practice and their profession. Um, so looking at the curriculum and what VR would allow us to do, um, we came up with the idea of developing a virtual agency which students could walk through and evaluate on how trauma informed that agency um, would look like. Um, we thought this was a great fit because as this is an online program, it would be impossible for us to bring our students together and visit actual agencies. Not to mention that would be disruptive to those agencies and their clientele. And also with the way trauma informed principles work, some agencies are very good at some things and not so good at others. So it would be impossible for us to find a single agency that would represent both the best and the worst of what trauma-informed looks like. So we thought that the, by developing this virtual simulation, we could offer the students a learning experience that we could not do in any other way using other technologies or in-person learning. Next. Um, again, we, we chose to position this, uh, the exploration of this with students in the doctoral seminar in trauma and human rights, um, uh, which I teach, and also to do that scaffolding of getting them more used to uh, being in VR, cross applications, um, and then it also really addresses the content of the course of course um, in, in terms of looking at physical environments and the degree to which trauma-informed principles are evident within those physical environments and allowing us to manipulate that. Um, so again, it, it seemed to be a good place to position this. And now I'm gonna um, move over to Samantha Corey uh, to talk about trauma-informed approaches. Thanks, Nikki. Mm -hmm. So being trauma-informed at its core, there's a couple concrete ways to, to think about this. The first and foremost is it really is a full organizational paradigm shift, if you will, no matter what kind of organization agency you're talking about. Our uh, VR was in a, a clinic, but certainly this applies to schools, hospitals, higher ed, you know, wherever it makes sense. And as you can see here on the slide, it is really this uh, paradigm shift where we're asking instead of what's wrong with somebody, it asks everybody in the system from uh, individuals to policies, procedures, the way we do work to really uh, mirror this piece around what has happened. Right. And so the way that this is being described is the, the new universal precaution, so to speak. So if you think about healthcare, for example, right, they put on gloves when they come in contact with any kind of uh, body fluid, right? They don't ask, do you have this? Are you infected with this? They just put on gloves just in case. All right. And so trauma informed care is termed the new universal precaution because similar, we are just assuming 
that everybody we come in contact with or anybody that comes into our clinic or our school or wherever we might be likely has a history of adversity, if not trauma. And as Mickey had mentioned before in the previous presentation, we really want to neutralize the potential for unintentionally um, re-triggering or what we call re-traumatizing individuals, both you know, clients and, and, and patients and students, but also the actual workforce that are delivering the services or doing what it is that they're doing. And so to, to sum this up, really the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA talks about the four R's. All right, so we realize that individuals and staff are likely to have histories of trauma. Um, we are able to recognize what that looks like in terms of signs or symptoms, if you will, indicators that trauma might be present. And we respond in the context of whatever our role or whatever our system's designed to do in a way that resists re-traumatization. So next slide, please, Mickey. And so, you know, this really comes down to what we call the, the values and principles of trauma-informed uh, care, which you've heard us mention a couple of times already this afternoon. And when thinking about the environment specifically, certainly these values and principles, which you can see here are safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, empowerment. It's possible to at least do no more harm, basically. We are, we are neutralizing the potential for that re-traumatization from happening, and then therefore hopefully promoting opportunity for, for healing and growth. And so what I will note is that there is a level of cultural, historical, and gender issues that are woven into all five of these values and principles. And we were very intentional about thinking about that as we were developing the um, VR simulation. And so for the sake of time, I'm just gonna give you uh, two examples of how we thought about these values and principles in the context of an actual physical space or the virtual space, right? And so thinking about safety, right? Safety and trauma-informed care is both physical and emotional. It's probably the most obvious one out of the five in terms of if we're thinking about the space that we're in, right? In terms of being welcoming, um, feeling more aesthetic and homey versus bare and sterile, right? And so in the higher trauma-informed setting, if you will, in terms of you'll see some of this in the video that Steve's gonna show, you know, there is more office decor. The lighting is not super bright, but it's not super dim. You know, we have, there's magazines and, and different things for, for people in the waiting room. There's a child play area, right? It's more welcoming and inviting. And so the higher trauma-informed setting had all of those pieces and then the, they diminished as we got to more of the lower settings. In terms of trustworthiness is just one more example before I pass it back to, to Mickey. This really is about transparency. How is it that information is communicated? How is it that people know what to expect? Um, and so for the higher trauma-informed setting, again, you know, we're thinking about things like signage, we're thinking about things like the receptionist at the front desk, um, hours posted, different things. And so the higher ones actually had all the signage available in both uh, English and Spanish um, based on the client population of the clinic, as well as the receptionist was oh my goodness, can't speak, spoke both when welcoming visitors. Um, the signage in general was more prevalent in terms of the higher trauma-informed settings, again, being very clear about what clients and visitors and staff could expect, what they, what would happen, you know, hours, all of those kinds of things. Um, and so we have a lot of other examples we could get into, but those are just a couple. Certainly choice, collaboration, empowerment were very much um, woven into this as well. And so I'll pass it back to Mickey. Thanks, Sam. Um, so yeah, really, uh, we wanted to develop this space that would allow students to actually walk through and evaluate all, all of those principles um, in that context and, and allow us also to manipulate that context so that we could have uh, sort of low, medium, and high levels of the expression of these um, uh, concepts. And for this, we had to look across um, a lot of different literatures, actually, to look at, um, uh, you know, human design, human-centered design principles, accessibility, and, and things like that, and, of course, the trauma-informed literature. Um, and, and this al allows the students to experience um, these different levels, but also allows them to evaluate uh, this particular uh, virtual agency on the application of those principles. Um, within the setting. So as I mentioned, we had a learning component for this. We developed uh, 11 different interaction points um, that uh, might be seen in typical agency settings. We kind of went for a sort of broad social service agency setting. Um, and we wanted to be able to see the low, moderate, and high levels of trauma-informed application. 
and we want, knew we wanted to have some narration to discuss the factors that we consider to be important for each of the areas. And this is the, uh, the, the tablet within VR, and you'll, you'll get to see that in action in the video. Um, and then we wanted an assessment component. We wanted the students to be able to respond to what they were seeing and, and to give, give feedback and to think it through. So uh, the, the application also allows for them to uh, audio record their answers in real time to these different aspects and, and provides them some opportunity to kind of reflect on what they're learning. Um, and then also we invite them to make uh, recommendations for changes that might, uh, that might be evident based on their evaluation. So I'm going to stop sharing and allow Steve now to share the video walkthrough. Sorry, hopefully everyone is seeing this, but this is what the students see. So this is one of our interaction points. This is a welcome desk. And as you can see, they can flip between low, moderate, and high to see what a different representation might look like. So the low is not welcoming at all. It feels more security. The high feels more welcoming. As they walk through, they're also able to um, listen to our narrator describe um, the different um, things they should think about in each area. In a minute, um, there will be a point with some audio um, where you'll be able to see what the narrator says and some of the other interaction points. But the students are able to move through the agency, move through the different areas, and interact with um, the different parts of the agency to see what the possibilities are and to get some idea of what they should consider. For instance, here's another example bulletin boards. Um, the way the information's presented, whether it's relevant to the population, are all things that the um, students should. You're late for your appointment, but I think we can still fit you in. Take a seat and fill out this intake form to the best of your ability while you wait. Hi, how are you? Please fill out this intake form while you're waiting for your appointment. Welcome, bienvenidos. We're glad you're here. Would you please fill out this form for us while you're waiting for your appointment? So those are just the three different levels of TI for how they um, would interact with the receptionist. And um, next you'll see in here what they actually get from the narrator as they are moving through. If you have any questions about the form, just let me know. Feel free to have some water while you wait. Please let me know if you need anything else. The physical environment can be very appealing and welcoming. However, relationship and engagement are critical for a sense of emotional safety. How individuals are greeted by the agency's receptionist is often the first interaction when someone visits an agency. In order for all individuals to feel safe, supported, and to begin to build trust in the treatment environment, it is critical that all interactions be positive, welcoming, and respectful. So as they're moving through the environment, they not only get to experience it, but we have that narrator acting as the more knowledgeable other in helping them understand the different things they should be paying attention to, the different um, qualities of the environment that could possibly be changed to make it more trauma-informed, and some ju just some general thoughts about um, how an agency should be set up so that it is more trauma-informed. So this is the first part of the uh, simulation where the students um, can go through and actually learn more about the principles um, this is integrated with, will be integrated with other materials we develop in the course so that they can get some prior knowledge about the principles and what they could expect. Um, so this just helps reinforce that other information that they've been learning. Um, as Mickey stated, we also have an assessment portion. Um, 
and you'll see that in a second. Um, but what the assessment portion allows them to do is go through and rate each of the areas. Um, they're given a different level of trauma informedness for each area and that's random. And so they have to decide whether what they're seeing is low, medium or high. And then as Mickey said, they're able to record an audio description of what they're seeing, what they would improve and how they would do that. So that is the video portion. I'm gonna stop sharing this and turn it back over to Mickey. Thanks, Steve. Um, wanted to, um, of course, we've just had uh, one cohort fully through this. We intend to, um, uh, we're, we're in the process of actually building out a module. We'll talk about that. But we, we wanted to get the initial impressions from students. And these are some of their quotes um, that they liked that they could switch between the different levels to that it really felt like an immersive experience, um, that they would be able to get a feel for things. Um, and then they also like the, both the, aud the, um, the audio and voiceover components because uh, listening was, was very important for them. So we were pretty encouraged by that. Um, at the same time, there are some issues. Um, uh, motion sickness is a serious issue. One that we have uh, tried to address in subsequent build outs of the environment. Um, uh, Steve, you can speak to the technical language of Bellowa, but it's about um, the frames, right? Like uh, reducing the, the frames. Can you explain that a little bit more? So um, one thing we noticed through our beta testing was that students were complaining about the motion sickness. So as students move through the environment, they have the option to either use free motion, um, Use, moving with the joystick, that type of thing, or they can teleport, which is a way to uh, move without experiencing as much motion. Sickness. But based upon their feedback, we did slow down the free motion and did some more testing, and that seems to have alleviated a lot of the motion sickness. Um, so we were able, we were happy to identify that early, and hopefully our fix is going to improve that for everyone moving forward. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. We also addressed things like the stylus was at a slightly awkward angle for how they were holding it. So we did some changes there. Um, there's that difficulty side loading the simulation into the headset that we described before. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what we can do about that at this stage, but it's something we're working on. And there was some um, need for us to clarify uh, the difference between the instructional and the assessment components and make that sort of walk students through that a little bit more easily. So that's um, something that we were addressing in subsequent builds. Um, we're, at, we're actually have just received what the, um, the developers think is the final build and we're, we're giving them our final feedback right now. Um, so in terms of future directions, um, we're going to use this again in uh, this coming fall with some enhancements. We think it's really important to create uh, materials like a mod modular experience um, to uh, scaffold and prepare students for going into the environment. Um, we're going to create some videos that give more um, instructions and a video walkthrough of how to set it up. And we're also working um, with some students to work on creating an accessible version, a 2D version for PC use for students um, for whom going into VR is problematic for one or another um, health reasons. Um, we're also exploring the possibility of compatibility for the, the cardboard-based devices in terms of looking at the priciness of all of this. And, um, and we, we hope to study the effectiveness of this simulation compared to traditional teaching methods as well. So we, we definitely wanna keep studying this. We think it's, a, it's an interesting thing that we've been involved with. Um, and we just had a paper accepted describing our um, development of this in uh, the Journal of Technology in, in Human Services. And that um, should, it's, uh, should be coming out anytime now. So, that is our presentation. If you have uh, questions, um, Steve uh, can handle those. You can also email me. I think uh, Luann and I gave our emails in the previous presentation, but we'd be happy to entertain any questions if we haven't blown through our time. <laughs> I'm 
just going to add to one point of how we're using this that I thought of as Mickey was talking to, as students advance in the program, what we're doing is we're actually, we had them go in as actual beta testers of this. But in addition, we're having them think about if they were to develop an app, what would that process look like? So thinking through their process of how they might develop something within VR. Um, in fact, the instructor in year two had them write a VR proposal of what they might be able to do in practice. So we're continuing this thread throughout their entire time with us. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we've got some students thinking about some pretty, um, not all of them are using VR, but some of them are thinking of some pretty incredible ways to integrate it within the practice setting. So I did just want to add that point. Thanks, Luann. We also have a question from Brian about how much it costs to develop something like this. Um, not including our FTE, which we had none on. We're just doing this because we think it's cool. Um, I'm thinking it was around 20K. Do I have that right, Steve? Well, our initial budget was 25, but then we were able to find some additional funding. So I think it's up around 38 right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's yeah, just- Yeah, I think you're right, Steve. I think it's 37 with the additional funding, but initially the project was 25 and we were fortunate that we were able to get some additional funding. So what that essentially enabled us to do is expand the project somewhat and add additional rooms to it. So, yeah. Interesting. Now, is that through Crosswater, or did you guys do that more in-house? Um, um, well, we did an RFP. Um, we're, we are actually working with uh, a company called Working Man out of Rochester, and yep. they've been great to work with. Very responsive, on time with stuff, um, and just really on the ball. I would, I, if you would like to talk more about that, feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to talk more about our experiences with them. Will do. Thank you, Steve. Um, also, I was wondering if you guys had any pushback on sort of requiring your students to purchase the Oculus Quest headset, because uh -huh. that's, you know, probably what, in the neighborhood of $300 or so. Um, were there any? Uh, Honestly, any no. I, I was nervous about that because actually we started with the first Quest. It was 400. It has dropped to three. Um, we haven't really gotten pushback on this. There's a couple students that really aren't liking VR all that well. We phrase it as, you know, this is, if you think about a textbook for the course, that's pretty similar right. in many cases. And it's something that they're supposed, that they'll be using consistently throughout the program. So for example, I'm doing implementation science. I have them think about ways they can integrate VR. So they're not necessarily in there as a group. We're still debating whether or not that's the best modality to do. But we are more interested in seeing them think about how we can apply this in practice, because I do believe it's got quite a bit of potential for them to build out in practice. So, and even things they're doing, like going into that room, we're saying, you know, think about some of them are thinking, oh, I could do training with staff in here too. So, you know, it does, yeah. So to answer your question, no, we haven't really to this point received a lot of pushback from our students. We also have it very transparent as they apply to this program, that that's something that they are going to be required to purchase. Okay, great, thank you. Um, 